Hello everyone, my name is Halsey. Welcome to another Sunday School lesson where we give an overview of the lessons based on the Precepts for Living commentary. Don't forget to give a thumbs up, to share, to subscribe, or even to leave a comment. This is the first lesson in Unit 2 of our summer quarter. And the theme for this lesson is focusing on God's people worship. All the lessons in July is focusing on worshiping in Jerusalem. Bible scripture for today, Sunday, July the 2nd, will be taken from Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 to verses 7. Lesson title is Joyful Worship Restored. Before we go into our lesson, let's have prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for making a way of restoration. Help us. Help us, Lord, to serve you in spirit and in truth. Help us, Lord, to examine our relationship with you, to see what we need to work on, to see what we need to change, what we need to fix so that we will be in good standing with you. Our relationship will be in good standing with you. And we say thank you. Thank you for helping us, Lord. Bless every listening ears. Cause hearts to receive. Bless every teacher's. Continue to give understanding. And we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your many, many blessings. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This lesson is outlined and it will be divided into two sections. Section 1 will deal with worship restored. And that's verses 1 through verses 5. Section 2 will deal with the temple restored, and that's verses 5, I'm sorry, verses 6 and 7. The aim for this lesson is that we know, that we know that we should celebrate and express thanks to God for his goodness. Desire to praise God for his goodness and praise God for his goodness. Before we go into our lesson, we will add a little bit of background. So our lesson is taken again from Ezra. Who was Ezra? Well, for one, we have learned that he was a priest. He was also a scribe and a great leader. His name means help. And, and Ezra was dedicated and committed uh, to serving the Lord. And of a people and the writing of Ezra is centered on God and his promise that a Judah would return to their homeland and Ezra not only he not only knew the word of God but he he obeyed he believed and he obeyed it and so leading up to our lessons we have learned that the first group of people uh, they were led by Zerubbabel uh, back to Jerusalem uh, to rebuild the temple. And then years later, the second group uh, came and, and, and Ezra was a major part of, of teaching them the law to rebuild the community, to rebuild their relationship with the Lord. And so let's see how uh, this all fits together so we know that between chapter 1 and chapter 6, it all began uh, with King Cyrus giving a decree after being moved by uh, the Lord uh, to allow the people to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And this would be a fulfillment of the prophecy by uh, the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah uh, chapter 25 that the exile would return. And this right here should give 
us hope. This fulfillment of prophecy should strengthen our hope in in the many other prophetic uh, promises. There are many promises, and every time that we see one being fulfilled, it should strengthen our hope. We have hope in the future Messiah in Jesus Christ coming back and ruling as our king. They were given hope uh, to return for the rebuilding of the temple. They were uh, given hope that the Lord would be with them and he would uh, bless them and provide for them the resources that they need to get the job done. And so with all these hope in mind, we see next uh, the leader Zerubbabel led the way for the exiles to return to Jerusalem. And so all together, there were three major leaders with different uh, roles who worked together to get the job done. Zerubbabel was in charge of the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra was in charge of restoring worship. And Nehemiah was in charge of the rebuilding of the wall. And again, as we keep in mind, they work together to get the job done. We will now go to section one and it will deals with worship restored. And that's verses one through verses five. Ezra chapter three, verses one through verses five. Reading from New Living Translation, verse one. Now in the early autumn, when the Israelites had a settle in their towns, all the people assembled together as one person in Jerusalem. And here we see that expression of unity among the people. They came together and they were working together on purpose to get the job done. We always are better together because, you know, we need each other. You may know something that I don't know, and I may know something that you don't know, but when we come together and we put our little bit together, it's very powerful because we're able to get the job done, like we're seeing them doing right here. Verse 2, And Joshua, son of Jezodak, with his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shetiel, with his family, began to rebuild the altar of the God of Israel so they could sacrifice burnt offerings on it, as instructed in the law of Moses, the man of God. And here, verse 2 lets us know that they came together and they rebuilt the altar first. And what does that show? Well, for one, it shows that they had learned to put the Lord first. What, what does uh, the altar represent? It represents repentance. It represents forgiveness. And it symbolizes God's presence. And the last uh, portion of it says that they sacrifice burnt offering on it as instructed by the law of Moses. And that was important for them to do, sacrificing the burnt offering. It signifies that the people were seeking the Lord's guidance. They were seeking his forgiveness. They were seeking to rededicate themselves to him as commanded they were seeking to walk in obedience to him because of over the years what uh, they did walking in disobedience and the punishment that they received now we're seeing 
a shift with them. They want to be in good standing with the Lord. So they build the altar first. And also knowing how they were surrounded by enemies. They better build the, the altar first. They need God's protection. They need his help. And you know, same is true for us. We too must acknowledge uh, our sins and acknowledge our offenses against the Lord because just like them, we want to make sure that our relationship with the Lord is in good standing. And we too, uh, like the exiles, we too must also uh, remember, remember the, the sacrificial offering, remember the ultimate fulfillment of the sacrifice is, is Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. We must not forget that. He sacrificed his life on the cross for us to restore our relationship back to a holy God. We too must never forget about that. Verse 3, even though the people were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar at its old site. Then they immediately began to sacrifice burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord. They did this each morning and evening. And here lets us know that the surrounding uh, people were hostile towards the returning exiles. That it causes them to be afraid. We also see how that fear was the driving force behind the construction of the altar. The Israelites were frightened. They were afraid. But they used that fear to cause them to seek the protection of God. They build the altar. And again, the altar is a place of humility. It's a place of surrendering. It's a place of asking God for help. Help me, Jesus, help me. When we go to the place of altar, wherever it is, and we get down on our knees, it is a good place for us to be asking the Lord to help us. We see here that they did not um, allow fear to stop them from doing what God had called them to do. They use it to be that driving force. And we too, again, we too, we too can take comfort when we are tempted, and we will, when we are tempted to walk in fear like these people, we too should again let it be that a driving force to make us brave and to make us bold to do what Jesus uh, has called us to do. Knowing that he's able to see us through anything. Knowing that if he calls us, he will also equip us. If he calls us to do it, he will equip us to complete it. Verse 4. They celebrated the festival of shelters as prescribed in the law of Moses sacrificing the burnt offerings specified for each day of the festival. And here we see how the feast was observed and how the regular sacrifice uh, was resumed. And the Feast of uh, Shelter, the Feast of Tabernacle, it was one of the um, three major feasts that the Israelites would celebrate. And they would give uh, God thanks uh, for his provision. They would be celebrating and, and thanking him for his protection, pr protecting them and for providing for them during their wilderness journey to the promised land. And, and during this time, uh, the families... Uh, they were commanded to camp out in temporary shelters. This was to remind them of God's goodness to them. They were to 
commemorate every year they were to celebrate in remembrance of God's goodness to them. And as we see uh, the people, how they courageously set up the altar on its old foundation and began offering the required morning and evening sacrifices to the Lord. And this time should be a time of rejoicing to them. Because remember, when they were away in Babylon, they were not able to do this. So this should serve as a time of reconnecting to the Lord. So when we think about our sacrifices uh, to the Lord, uh, we may not be practicing the Old Testament sacrifices. However, the sacrifices that we practice, such as prayer or praise or thanksgiving or worship to the Lord in the morning, at noontime, in the evening, or whenever, it should be a time of of joy. It should be a time of rejoicing. It should be a joyous time for us knowing that we, we can come boldly to the throne of God to obtain his mercy and his grace to help us in times of trouble. We should take great joy knowing that we don't have to go through a priest to get to the Lord. We, where we are today, we have direct contact because of whom we are in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for making this possible for us. Verse 5, they also offer the regular burnt offerings and the offerings required for the new moon celebration and the other annual festivals to the Lord. Free will offerings were also sacrificed to the Lord by the people. So continuing from the previous verse, we see how the participation of all, all the various uh, feasts were uh, a continual thing. It was going on and it also point to that intimate bonding and unity and how that unity would serve as oneness. They were doing it together and by doing it together, they were strengthening one another. It would make them stronger as a nation together, one. And they also mention a free will offering and that would carry the idea of voluntarily giving, giving from one heart, not being forced to do it, but giving from one's heart, what you have to give from your heart. Freely giving from one's heart. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Give it from a cheerful place, not forced to do it and do it grudgingly. Free will offering, volunteer to give it from one's heart, lovingly and cheerfully. We will now go to section two. It will deal with the temple restored. Verse six. 15 days before the festival of shelters began, the priests had begun to sacrifice burnt offerings to the Lord. This was also before they had started to lay the foundation of the temple. And we talk about uh, the priests and the burnt offering. The, the burnt offering was the primary, primary sacrificial ceremony because it reverence the Lord. If we take a look at Leviticus chapter 1 and we will start reading at verse 7. The sons of Aaron, the priests, will build a wood fire on the altar. Aaron's son will then put the pieces of the animal, including its head and fat, on the wood fire. But the 
internal organs and legs must first be washed with water. Then the priests will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar. It is, it is a whole burnt offering made by fire, very pleasing to the Lord. So we know that from right here, the burnt offering was a very pleasing thing to the Lord. The Lord, it was a reverential time. It represent sweet smelling smoke that rises upwards to the Lord an ascended smoke that went up and it would be a soothing aroma to the Lord. To the lesson, verse seven, then they hired masons and carpenters and bought cedar logs from the people of Tyre and Sidon, paying them with food, wine, and olive oil. The logs were brought down from the Lebanon mountains and floated along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea to Joppa, for King Cyrus had given permission for this. So again, uh, after the restoration of the altar uh, began, now they, they would follow through by assembling and hiring workers they needed to build the temple. And God would made provision for them to do so. And he would work through King Cyrus. King Cyrus wasn't even a Jew, but God used him to help them to get the job done. And so the people would not uh, lack. They wouldn't walk in lack of anything. They would have all the resources that they needed to get the job done. And once again, we continue to see that example of unity and God's provision. If the Lord has given us a challenge, he will provide the necessary resources to get the job done. So as we close our lesson, what can we take away? Well, for one, uh, the people arrival back to Jerusalem, it lets us learn that we, we must always begin with the Lord and to do what we can do and leave the rest of the Lord. The, the exile at first could not build the temple, but they build what kept them connected to the Lord. They build the altar, a place of forgiveness, a place of repentance, a place that will help them to connect back to their holy God. We also saw how fearful uh, they were of danger and how that fear uh, push them to face their enemies and to do it afraid. You know, sometimes we just have to do it afraid. Sometimes we just have to do it afraid because God will help us to push through that fear to get the job done. Whatever the Lord has called us to do, we must depend upon him and depend on his provision to help us to get the job done. Also, here are some questions to consider. Question number one, what are some of the most common causes for disunity then and now? Question two, what can we learn from this lesson about how we should respond when God disciplines us. Question three, what can sometimes be the result of walking in fear? 
And so as we go through this week, let us have an aim. Let us have an aim to check and see if our relationship is in good standing with the Lord. To check and see what we need to do to reinstate, to reinstitute, to restore, to rebuild our relationship with the Lord. What do we need to do? We need to check and see what we need to do to stay connected to a holy God. And this will conclude our lesson. If you have heard something that was helpful to you, please give a thumbs up, share, subscribe, or even to leave a comment. But most importantly, remember we are building the kingdom of God together one lesson at a time. God bless you. Until next time. Bye-bye.